Welcome to Dr. Green Speaks. What's up, family? You know who I be. It's the kid again, Dr. Green. Yeah, you heard it. Listen. Bridging the gap between scholars. Read more books than the curriculum profile. Doctors, athletes, and pop culture influencers. <laughs> Major show alert. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. And now, Dr. Green Speaks. Bring them out. Bring them out. What's up, family? You know who I be. It's the kid again, Dr. Green. Yep. Yeah. You heard of me. Listen, I told you, Dr. Green Speaks, the podcast is here. And today I have as my guest a brother whose story is so amazing that if you in your own imagination tried to write a story about grit, resilience, and success, it wouldn't come close to this brother's story. I have with me today, Dr. Russell Lede. What's up, family? How are you? What's up, Dr. Green? Mo? what's up, man? I'm glad to be here, right? Man, I'm, I'm glad. So glad. <laughs> I, I listen. I'm cheesing, man, because I just trying to go through all of your credentials would take like a year and a half. And it's not just about the credentialing; it's the actual work that you're doing. So, what I'd like to just do is step back for a minute and just let you tell our listening audience about who you are and where that story begins. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Russell Lede, um, as, as, as Mo put it out. And um, currently I'm a cancer scientist and also a medical student, um, as well as a business student at Tulane University School of Medicine and Freeman School of Business. Um, but my, my story really started in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, my mother was a single mother of two. Um, essentially the epitome of the black mom, the black queen, um, the center of the black community, raising two uh, kids by herself. You know, uh, my dad and my mom, I think split before my before my, my mom had me. And then I don't really know the story on my sister's dad. He just never was really around. And so my mom did what she had to do. You know, she put the grizzle to the grizzle and made it happen. And, you know, raised as best as she could. She was a certified nurse's aide. And, you know, one of the things that I, I always, you know, try to highlight in um, in my interviews is that, like, you know, my mom couldn't afford to really send us to really good schools or give us really good education. Um, but what she did do is she made the best out of nothing. So I told y'all she was a certified nurse's aide and she would work at these resident homes or nursing homes. And when these people would finish reading these books. She would take the books from them and say, like, yo, is it OK if I bring this home to my son and my and my daughter? And that's really how I got exposed to, to books. So by the time I graduated high school, I had read nearly 2000 books. Um, yeah. By the time I graduated high school, I was like, but what's crazy is, is I graduated high school. Hadn't read like 2000 books. Right. And didn't even think I was smart enough to go to college. So that's why I had to go to the Navy. Um, I opted to go to the Navy, one, because it was also going to give me an out. You know, by the time I got to high school, my mom was really struggling to make ends meet. She was doing everything she could, but, you know, the prices inflating and things of that nature. Like, we got to a point to where we was digging in dumpsters behind Sam's Club um, for dinner after school. Um, with my grandmother and my mom in the car watching me and my sister digging in the dumpster, climbing in the dumpster and get the journal pieces out and grapes and bread um, to bring home and then put it in the freezer and we'll eat it throughout the week. Um, so it was it was, it was was tough, man. You know, of course, we had the candle days and days when we didn't have running water. Um, but we made it happen. I remember there was a point when my auntie, my mom and my grandmother were like pool the food stamps together to go and buy half of a cow um, and then split up all the meat between us and it would like hold us, you know, for like maybe like a couple weeks, sometimes a month. And that's how we got by, man. So I, 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 I love that experience in hindsight, but hated it as a kid growing up because it was challenging. So, you know, when I had an opportunity to get out, which was through the Navy, I took it. You know, and that, that really gave me an opportunity to, to get three hots in the cot. It gave me an opportunity to go and uh, and get a paycheck. And then it also gave me an opportunity to see the world. So I took it. It was like a ticket out of living hell, essentially. Um, and I took it. 
And so that's that's pretty much where I guess my own personal journey really started off. Um, and, you know, I, I, I went to the United States Navy with the idea of staying in the Navy because it sounded like a good idea a good opportunity for me to make a paycheck for forever, man. Like I could retire after 20 years. Obviously things didn't work out that way, but I, I'm happy that they didn't work out that way because I wouldn't be where I'm at right now if I would have just stayed complacent, you know? So my first, when I got out of, I got selected for something really special, which was called the United States Navy Ceremonial Guard. Um, those are the people that you generally see on TV you know, standing next to these heads of state at these events and they just stand in there for hours on end or you see them marching in all these parades and stuff like that or burying people in our international cemetery. And so I did that for two years. And after those two years is over, um, you pretty much get a pick of the litter where you want to go and what you want to do. So I decided um, that I was going to go into cryptology intelligence. So basically that's just training. Um, and the training I went to was in Pensacola, Florida. So I moved down to Pensacola, Florida. At this point, I'm married. Um, and But my wife, this is her first time living with me in Pensacola, Florida. We there for about six months. So at this point, it's like 2000 and I guess, yeah, 2007, early 2007. January to like July of 2007, I was in Pensacola, Florida. And my wife and I, that was the first time we lived together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we had to figure that out because that's challenging. You know, you got to figure out if it's okay to leave the cap off the toothpaste or who's going to cook, you know, all the challenging things that come with, you know, a a newlywed marriage. And I think that was like the biggest growing point for our marriage um, early on. Um, I think New York was probably our biggest um, growth overall. Um, And I'll talk about that in a second. So essentially after that, I got put aboard a ship um, and we had to move in like July of 2007 um to jacksonville florida and i was there for about two and a half years um aboard ship just like deploying all the time like sometimes seven days sometimes six months sometimes three months sometimes this sometimes that and eventually my wife looked at me and was like listen we can't build a family like this like this is not gonna work like i'm not about to sit up here and raise these kids by myself Mm. so she was she looked at me in the eyes and said look I think you're smart enough to go to college. And of course I laughed at her. I was like, bro, you crazy. Like you, you are out of your mind. Um, she was like, nah, I'm serious. Um, and I remember having a conversation with a guy named Richard Engel. Richard Engel was like the, he was like my immediate boss when I was aboard that ship. And this is when I started taking seriously what my wife was telling me about the possibility of me going to college. But you know, sometimes when your lady is telling you something, you hearing her because she's speaking to your heart, but you kind of need somebody to speak to your mind too. So, you know, me and him was on watch. It was like probably midnight. It was a boy ship just in the middle of the ship. And I was like, yo, I was like, yo, you think I'm smart enough to go to college? That was legitimately my question. I was like, yo, you think I'm smart enough to go to college? And he like laughed at me. Wow. He was like, he was like, yo, when you go to college, he was like, you'll run circles around everybody. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he was like, bro, he was like, you like one of the smartest people I ever walked around. And it, it really made sense in hindsight because like, so there's a certification you have to get when you get in the Navy, right? I got on board the ship um, in July of 2007. That certification usually takes like a year to a year and a half. I think I got that certification in like a month and a half. And, and like everybody on the ship was like, bro, like, how did you do that? Like, how? And I like, aced every test. And they have like a verbal boy in the chief's mess, and I, I killed it. And they was just like, this is crazy. Like, this dude is insane. Um, and so, of course, you know, with that and, and the confidence between Richard Engel and my wife, like, we made a decision, like, all right, I'll go to college. So I got off of active duty and we moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I started undergrad at Southern University. And so when I was off of active duty, I wasn't getting paid as much. So at this point, I'm like, I'm only in the reserves, which is like two, three hundred dollars a month. And I had to get a real job. So I got a job as a security guard. It was literally the only job I applied for. Um, so I applied to be a security guard. 
at a hospital. I got the job the same day I, I interviewed and I had no intentions of being a doctor. I wanted to be a social worker. I went to Southern University to be a social worker because I grew up on food stamps and those were the only people I saw who was like looking out for us. Like, you know, they help us with um, section eight. They help us with food stamps. They help us with child support. They helped us with everything. So I was like, yo, I'm going back to the hood and be a hood hero. Um, and so, right, right. You, you know, at this point, we in this is like 2009, August 2009. I get this job. And now at this point, I'm working as a security guard full time. Um, I'm in undergrad and I'm still in the reserve. So on a normal day, my schedule was wake up at five, go for a run, whatever. Um, and then go to school from eight to three fifteen. Get off at 3.15, go to the hospital, be there by 3.45, work from 4 to midnight, and then go home, study, and then do it again every day. On the weekends that I had reserve duty, I would go my full day from 8 to 3.15, 4 to midnight, and then drive from Baton Rouge to Pensacola, Florida, which is like five hours away, so that I was there by 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. And then work all day, study in the evening, sleep work all day on Sunday and then drive back to, to to Baton Rouge so that I could go back to school on Monday because reserve duty is on the weekend. So I was grinding and we had just had a newborn and I was remodeling our house. So I was like doing everything and I was doing research in undergrad. So, you know, it, I mean, I, I think a lot of my grind and how I was able to do so much at the same time is because I watched my mom do it. You know, I watched my mom like, raise two kids, go to work, cook, clean, do everything all on their own, like all at the same time. So I was like, yo, I could do 20 different things at one time. You feel me? Um, and so essentially when I was in the hospital as a security guard, um, I didn't really think I could become a doctor, bro. Um, I just started imagining it because like, I felt like the doctors were walking around with white coats on. And they were like gods. It was like like many gods walking around. They like healing people, taking care of people who are sick and this and that. And it start, you know, I just started imagining like, dang, bro, it's a possibility. It's something. And, and I started looking into what you need to do. First thing I saw was shadowing. So I started asking, you know, doctors like, yo, can I shadow you? And a lot of them were laughing. They were like, yo, security guards don't become doctors. Like <laughs> security guards don't become doctors. And I'm just like, all right, okay, all right, whatever. But eventually, there's this one guy I met by by straight happenstance. I was working in the ER, and Buddy just pulled up. He was the chief uh, resident um, on this for surgery, and he was trying to get to the operating room from the emergency room, which is like rare because most people just come in through the front of the hospital to get to the OR. But he came in through the ER and needed somebody to escort him because he didn't know where he was going. So I told my boss, like, look, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my post and I'll escort him. I started escorting him. And as we were walking, a little short dude, a little short bald head guy, I was like, yo, you really a surgeon? He was like, yeah. I was like, bet. You think I can shadow you? He looked at me and was like, yeah, bro, no problem. <laughs> like, he ain't want no problem. So he was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, whatever, bro. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Whatever you want. And uh, he let me shadow him, bro. He gave me his phone number or whatever. And... I thought he was joking. I got home that night at midnight, went, ran in there, tried to wake my wife up to tell her. I was so excited because the dude gave me his number. And I texted him the same night. He was like, yo, meet me here tomorrow morning. I got off at midnight. He was like, meet me here tomorrow morning. We'll sign the paperwork and get you in the OR the next day. We walk into the OR straight up. Next morning, I come in. We fill out paperwork. We walk into the OR. And it's a world-renowned breast oncology surgeon in there, a black dude. Never forget him. His name was Dr. Peter Bostic. Well, you could look him up, world-renowned uh, breast cancer surgeon. Um, and I was like, oh, I really could do this now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, and, you know, so that happened. Right. And, right. and, and essentially, you know, that kind of sold me on the idea that, yo, I could really do this. So all through our undergrad, I was shadowing and doing research in the lab because, Basically, I went in there thinking I was going to be a social worker. A chemistry teacher saw me, and she was like, we need social workers, but you seem like you're like extremely brilliant. Like, what? Like, have you ever thought about being a scientist? And she said this because I was in her class. You know, everybody takes general chemistry classes. 
And I was sitting in her class and I was like, I had memorized the entire periodic table in like one or two days. And she was like asking people like what the symbols meant. And I was just like naming them all. Boom, 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 boom. She was like, who are you? She was like, yo, you need to meet a scientist. So she let me meet a scientist. And he started pushing me in that direction, told me I should switch my major to chemistry and biology. And the pavement, I mean, you know, the tire really hit the road when it got time for me to graduate from undergrad. And I tried to apply to medical school and I failed, but I also had a backup plan. I applied to graduate school, but I only applied to one school. I applied to NYU School of Medicine because I had met the dean over there. Um, the dean was a guy named Dr. Joel Oppenheim. And he had told me, like, bro, you could go get a PhD. You're smart enough. And I was like, yeah, whatever. But, you know, when it was time, I was like, yo, this is going to be my backup plan. So nevertheless, you know, I, I applied um, to NYU School of Medicine, didn't get any any medical schools, but got into NYU School of Medicine to get my PhD, looked at my wife and said, we moving to New York. We moved to New York. Um, and I started working on my PhD and it was, whew, it was rough and it was tough. And it was everything, you know, that comes with getting the PhD, which Mo, I know you, you already know about that already. So you already know what time it is. Um, and so, you know, I, I did my PhD thing and like two years in, I started getting the hang of it. And sure enough, uh, I had applied for this fellowship from the Ford Foundation in my first year and it didn't get accepted. Um, but then in my second year, it got accepted. And then I got nominated for this Howard Hughes Medical Institute Fellowship. And that was like the creme de la creme. You know what I'm saying? Like, like <laughs> it's only like five black PI, like at the time it was only like five black PIs that were Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So I knew if I got that, I'd be like, I'd be in the creme de la creme. And I knew my research was good enough too, you know? So I applied for that and I got it. And then my best friend got it. And he and I was in the same lab. We both went to HBCUs and we was both black dudes from the South. So you couldn't tell that lab, nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like we had this like, you know what I'm saying? Mad, like mad PWI. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it's only like a few black people there. And we like balling out of control in terms of research money. So we was on 10, you know, and, and just living our best life. But, um, you know, it, it, when I got ready to finish my PhD, I looked at my PIs and was like, yo, I don't feel adequate just yet. Um, and they was like, so what do you think is missing? And I was like, yo, I understand prostate cancer scientifically, but I don't understand it clinically. And it was like, sounds like you need to go to medical school. And I was like, all right, but like, who going to accept me? And they was like, listen, everybody going to accept you, though. They was like, the question is, who ain't going to accept you? It was like, you're going to have a problem picking where you're going to go. So I applied. Um, I got six interviews. I got six acceptances. I felt like every last one of those interviews and people was like, they wanted to tell me they was going to accept me right then and there. Um, and, and at some point, yo, at some point in this interview, ask me about Cornell. I'll tell you a little short story. It'll blow your mind, dog. I never forget going to Cornell. Um, but nevertheless, I ended up selecting coming to Tulane because my wife and I was tossing around the idea of me staying in New York or us staying in New York or us coming back to Louisiana. We have been gone for a long time. You know, we have been leaving for the military, come back home for undergrad, leaving for a PhD. Did we really want to come back? And this time when we came back, where are we going to stay? So we were still on the fence about it. And my wife was pregnant with our second daughter. So at this point, it's like winter of 2018. We're living in New Jersey, in Jersey City. And um, my wife goes into labor February 20th, 2018. And it's around 9.43, my second daughter is born. And we go to sit down in the little recovery area after my wife, you know, gave birth. And um, I check my email because I was applying to medical school. And when you apply to medical school, you check your email incessantly. And I got an email from Tulane. 
I still have that email still to this day. I still got that email still to this day. And they told me they had a full ride for medical school. For me to go to medical school at Tulane for free. 100% free. Um, and I looked at my wife. My wife looked at me. And she said, I think we're about to go home. And we made a decision to go home, you know, without even um, knowing whether or not Tulane was going to accept. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, whether or not Cornell was going to accept me. Um, Cause Cornell's acceptance came out a little bit later, I think like early March. And um, sure as I tell you, man, we made this decision to come home and I would easily say it was the best decision ever. Um, you know, we have two kids now, you know, and obviously we've been able to do some amazing work with the 15 white coach um, and, you know, other stuff that I'm doing with the real docs and, and all that kind of stuff. So I've been able to do some real transformative work here in Louisiana Um and it's all because, like, you know, I, I kind of listen to, you know, my my guidance, you know, which for me is, is the Holy Spirit and, and my wife and just sitting out having a conversation. And, you know, we just made the best decision for us, which was coming home. And I, 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 I will never look back. I think this is the best decision I've ever made in my life by a mile. This is the best decision I've ever made in my life. Yo, man, you can't make this up. Like your your life course trajectory is amazing. Um, there are so many different parts of what you said that I'd like to dive into. But what, what I'd really like to, you to talk about is the importance that that your your family, that your wife has played in getting you to where you are now. Because obviously, obviously you know and I know. You, you know and I know. That's like the, the narrative about black men. They're not home. They leave. They they make babies. They disappear. They they're not responsible. They're not in the home. And obviously, you stand as a direct contradiction to the narrative about the absent black father, the dysfunctional black man, what what people you know present as toxic masculinity, which unfortunately has been you know, use synonymously with masculinity general, right? So talk talk to us a little bit about the part that, that she plays. And um, like there's a hashtag, right? Girl dad, right? So you're a girl dad too. So can you tell us a little bit about how that plays a part in your life? Yeah, man. So great, great question, Mo, man. Uh, first, I'll start with my wife, man. You know, so I, I talk about this all the time. Um, whether I'm on TV or on a podcast or just doing interviews, you know, my wife was truly my first mentor. Um, she was the first person to, you know, really tell me that I could be amazing and mean it. Like she was, she meant it so much that like she put action behind it. Um, I think my mom always told me that I was smart. Um, but my mom did the best she could with the resources that we had. And I love my mom to death for that. Um, I think what my wife did, um, not to compare my mom and wife, but I think what my wife did was she, like, helped me make big decisions. Um, and then she not only helped me to make those big decisions, she walked in the sand with me when I made those big decisions. And then just say, like, let me watch him go. Um, she, she walked with me when it was time for me to decide to get out of the Navy. You know, she, she, I'll never forget when we decided to get off of active duty, my wife took a Greyhound bus from Jacksonville, Florida to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to go find us a house without any leads, without any leads. She took that trip and then did it again because she couldn't find any the first time. Um, and we ended up buying our first house in um, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She was like, she has been like the ride or die for like 1,010%. And so like having someone like that by you who's like, yo, what do you want to get out of life? But I think the main reason why she asked that question is because she understood that I had a lot of capability, but I wasn't aware of my, I wasn't aware of my superpowers. So that was the game changer was that like she made me aware of what I was capable of doing. She could see what I was capable of doing 
when I ain't had no clue, like even now, she like we were on our ride back here. I, I talked to you earlier and was telling you, like, you know, we were on our ride back here. And um she told me she was like, you know, one thing I love about you is that you make decisions and stand behind it, even when everybody else is unwilling to say something. And that's like she was like, that's rare. Like that's that, you know, the fact that you going you gonna stand on this, you know, you're gonna stand on what's right. When everybody else is like quiet and hush mouth, like you gonna you gonna ride or die for what's right, and I think I get a lot of that from her boldness, like her boldness in really tenuous moments of telling me, "Baby, you capable? Like you can't go do this." Like when it was time for me to go get my PhD, yo, no lie, quick story. When I when I got my score back from my MCAT for the first time when I was an undergrad, it was terrible, and I cried. I sat on my couch and cried. My wife walked up to me and laughed at me. And we just had my we just had my oldest daughter at the time who was like two or three. She told my oldest daughter, get your clothes, put your uh, jacket on, we going to celebrate. I was like, what y'all going to celebrate? I just got the most terrible score I could possibly get. She was like, we going to celebrate this because it doesn't matter what score you got. God going to make a way no matter what. Like, <laughs> so, you know, in that moment, I was like, Bro, this is terrible. Like she tripping right now. But now I look back on it, I'm like, dang, bro, she knew what she was talking about. You know, so that's that's it. And then for my kids, man, like I didn't grow up with my dad in my house. And so like every day I get an opportunity to, you know, wake up with my kids hugging me in the morning, man. You know, wake up with my kids like telling me like that, I love you. You know, wake up with my kids cooking in the kitchen with me. You know, right now we building my daughter's clothing brand. Um, and I get to sit down with a 10 year old queen who's like, I'm watching my child who's in the first thing she says is that I want my company to be like yours. I want it to be successful like yours. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? So like, I didn't have that at home. And, and the fact that, you know, I am a girl dad, but I get to like, listen to her voice and listen to her say that, you know, I was able to go to my, youngest daughter's birthday party on Saturday and just take pictures, you know, like it's, it's, it's the things that I didn't witness that I'm able to do now that just make it that much more special. Yeah. And I think that that's really an important, you know, uh, an important thing to share because a lot of, a lot of people haven't experienced the type of life that they're creating. Right. So it's kind of like we're trailblazers. Right. And, and for you to be able to see your daughter, you know, and, and, and experience her lived experience. Right. Because it's so much it's, it's a stark contrast um, in comparison to how you grew up. Right. And, and so so along that line, um, do you ever feel like you have to uh, treat her in a way or, or teach her some things that she won't learn? Because she's not, you know, experiencing what you experience. Because sometimes there's that, you know, I want them to be tough or I want them to be, you know, gritty or have resilience. And sometimes they make the mistake of like, I'm going to try to make them tough because they're not getting what I got. How do you deal with that? Or have you found new and creative ways to try to give your children the kind of um, resilience and grit? without them having to experience the hardships and difficulties that you had to um, experience to come to where you are? Yeah, man, that's a great question. I think it's a careful balance, to be honest with you. Um, I think there are moments in which I make sure that I, you know, teach my daughters things that I know they wouldn't naturally experience. But I also recently tweeted about this the other day. There are moments that I sit back and I say to myself, I think I'm over dadding to make up for lost time that I didn't have as a child. Um, if that makes sense. I, I truly think there are moments when I'm like over dadding or I'm over loving my kids or I'm over providing for them. Um, that I think just comes with my experience being meshed with theirs like i'm trying to imagine what the baseline of fatherhood is because i didn't have that lived experience within my home when i was growing up 
So it's not that my dad wasn't around. My dad was around. It's just that I didn't have that lived experience at home. And, and the experience is very different when you are in the home and you have a family unit. Like for me, I have my wife, I have my two kids, and we all live in the same home. Um, and so we have like this ecosystem going on emotionally, physically, and spiritually in which like we're all trying to balance the efforts that we're making to make life better for everyone. And for me, you know, when I focus on my two girls, I really think about like, what can I provide to them that even when I'm gone, they'll have. Um, and, and that's just imaginative because I don't have a baseline. You know, I, I don't have a reference point. And so it, it, a lot of what I'm doing as a parent, especially as a dad, is imaginative because I don't have a, a blueprint. I don't have a blueprint. So I'm just imagining as I go. I'm kind of figuring it out as I go, man. Thank you for sharing that, man. That's really that's really insightful. And I think I'd be a little disingenuous if I didn't address something that I heard you say, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So that speaks to a level of spirituality um, that that um, I think is really important just for you to express or to explain to the listeners. Tell us about the part that spirituality plays in your in your daily walk as a as a scientist, as a as a scholar, as a as a, a father and a husband. Yeah, man. So, I mean, for me personally, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and. It, I truly, my wife and I say this all the time, man. We would not have gotten this far without our faith, bro. Our faith is literally our walk, bro. Like, people always hear our story, um, and they're like, how? Like, how did y'all do all this? And I always tell them, my wife and I have this motto that we both live by. We've been living by since high school, which is we're going to defy the odds. Odds are... You know, we got married really young. We probably should have been divorced by now. Odds are we should be broke right now. Odds are we should be clueless by now. There are so many odds that were factored against us. But I think those odds were defeated. Specifically, that's my belief. It's by our belief um, in God and in, in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Like, that's that's what I, you know, left myself at was I can't explain very much in my life without mentioning God, bro. Because there were too many moments where we were supposed to fall off the cliff, bro. And literally, my wife and I would turn to each other and be like, like, we just got to pray more. We were already praying, but now we got to pray more. And then just trust God. God will figure out the rest. So many decisions we made um, were literally based on us trusting God to carry us when we had no clue. And so for me, so many decisions I make in life are just based on what, what I feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. And they may not necessarily make sense to the folks around me, but my wife and I are generally on one accord. And that's all that really needs to work for our story to continue. Thank you. Now, that's awesome. That's that's such a beautiful, beautiful um, caveat to to um, to understanding like who you are as a person because obviously we are the lived experiences of our past and and the fact that you have such a strong spiritual um base for you and your wife obviously it's for your children also i mean i you know i i honestly uh can attest to the fact that when i look back over my life and i i see the ways in which i was supposed to fail you know people were expecting me to fail you know, I was expecting me to fail, right? And then, you know, it turns around and it's not, you know, it's not just like it's fortuitous. No, because I believe that, you know, every good and perfect gift, right? You know, it comes from God. And I, you know, I was raised by my mother, the same, very, very similar background, you know, single mom, you know, she's a, you know, she's a, a diehard Christian. So, so, you know, spirituality has played a, a very important part in my life course also. So just tell us a little bit about your research because um, that's obviously really important. So they they often say that that black people, when we when we get educated, when we go to school, like we generally study things, right, that are related to our experience in one way or another, right? It's, it, so 
tell us a little bit about like your area of interest, your research and, and what it means, you know, to the general public. Yeah, man. So I think there may be a little bit of truth to that, that oftentimes people do study things that are, you know, in some way connected to their lived experience, where they're from, whatever. Um, my research was in prostate cancer and specifically looking at protein modification, specifically phosphorylation of proteins um, by an oncogenic kinase in prostate cancer and how that would, you know, essentially uh, make prostate cancer just a tad bit less treatable. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the idea behind the work was to use this really cool technique that was developed by this guy named Kayvon Shokat out of UCSF, um, where, so I guess in like the most simple term, a kinase is an enzyme that utilizes a, a adenosine triphosphate to phosphorylate proteins and what wait, that means wait. is that Man, did you just say wait, put the camera on me hold on hold on, hold on. time out because you, you you time out stop the whole show did you say simply and then take us down like the medical dictionary like <laughs> you can't do that to me you can't do that to my listeners and I'm not putting up with that. So you have to break this down like you're talking to a five-year-old. Because he yeah. used to be talking. I was like, if, if protein, a phosphorus, uh, what was that word? You're not going to do that. Now, <laughs> tell us. <re> <laughs> so, so, yeah, break that down again. <laughs> okay. So basically, let me, let me put it to you like this. Thank you. Put it to me like this. Think, yeah, yeah. Think of a kinase as like a baseball glove. Come on, now we talking. I'm, I'm with you now. Yeah. I got <laughs> and then think of ATP as like a baseball, right? So a baseball can fit very nicely into, you know, a regular baseball glove, right? And then a baseball glove is a perfect fit for a baseball. So they are matching heaven. They fit really well. But what if I took the baseball glove and I turned it into a softball glove? And then, right, I took the baseball and I turned it into a softball. Um, and that's essentially what we ended up doing was that we took this protein that has this, like, catalytic activity and made the pocket that the baseball generally fits in a little bit bigger and used just a different version of what would equate to a baseball in that pocket such that every time... The, the softball glove would use a baseball to tag another protein. It would leave behind a clue that it, you know, that it actually tagged that protein. And then you can separate out all the proteins that were tagged by that softball glove um, kinase and then identify those proteins and then see which one of those proteins are important for cancer to be just a little bit less treatable. Um, and that's essentially what we were able to do, which is a really cool approach. Um, that took a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of focus, and ended up getting published in a really popular journal. So um, that was really cool, man. And that's that's like in like the simplest terms. Uh, I, appreciate I appreciate it. You're not going to just come over here. It's my show and be throwing words around, and I got to shake my head like I know what you're talking about. And do this. <laughs> right? And while I'm sitting there saying, <laughs> You're not doing that to me, but so so what is the so what is the end goal? So is it so it, you said it makes um, it less treatable? So is that for the purpose of being able to to do the exact opposite to find ways to block that? Right. So like the idea is is that like if we know that a kinase is you know modifying a protein such that it makes the cancer just a tad bit less treatable then can we block that kinase and then hopefully treat cancer, right? Like that's the whole idea behind it. Um, in the most simplest terms, that's that's essentially what we're doing. And, you know, it, I think the idea of blocking this particular kinase and kinase is similar to it, it's not something that's new. It's just that having an idea of what this kinase is phosphorylating okay. is something that, you know, my work really focused on. Um, yeah. 
Oh, that's awesome. No, I appreciate you sharing that. So, wow. So, so let's let's dive in just a little deeper because, you know, as a, as a critical criminologist, you know, it, and looking at the ways in which specifically black boys refute negative predictive statistics, right? Mm-hmm. According to probably every statistic as it relates to black boys growing up in poverty, you were supposed to lose. Yeah. You, myself, we're supposed to be in prison, jail, dead, yeah. whatever. Yeah. If you had an opportunity, like you do at this point, right, to speak to young black boys that look like you, right, that are hoping to figure out what their life might be, right, or, or what would you tell them if you were looking at them right now? Yeah, I think I tell them to stop stop believing in naysayers, man. Um, the one thing that carried me was this ability to not believe what everybody was saying. Um, and I actually just told this to my brother um, before I got on to, you know, uh, Dr. Green Speaks. And basically, you know, what I told him was, is, bro, listen, just stay focused, man. Like, don't, it's like, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have challenges. It's supposed to be difficult. You're supposed to be tired. It's not just going to be easy. That's not, that's not the way this works. Um, but what you can do is be successful. How are you going to be successful? By staying focused. You're going to have distractions, man. Like they're going to be there. You you broke. Um, sometimes you even, you're uneducated. You don't have resources. You don't have a wherewithal, but you have accessibility sometimes. Like and I'm not saying, you know, the one thing that's kind of hard to, to balance, man, is, is like some people say, like, how long does it take? And I always tell them, like, it takes as long as it needs to take. Facts. Like, stop putting a time limit on it, because, like, if you put a time limit on it and you 80 percent of the way there, then do you just stop? Right. right. Or do you keep going? Like, you 80 percent of the way there. You know, right now I'm like about 90 percent of where I want to be. I got 10% to go. But it took me until I was 34. So do I quit now? Nah, man. Like, that's crazy. You know, um, yeah, that's just where I'm at. You know, that's just where I'm at with it, man. It's, it's, it's a matter of one, internally believing that you can do it and then looking for opportunities, bro. No matter how small they are, looking for opportunities to move upward. Right. And that's easier said than done. That's it. I, I will be sitting up here lying to you if I tell you that that's easier said than done. Right. I think also another important point is exposure, right? Exposure because a lot of us grew up in that little four block radius, five block radius, one mile, you know, one square mile. And that's, you know, that's our reality. And, and like, for example, you going to the Navy, right? Like you said, allowed you to see things that maybe you couldn't even imagine before you did it right but then once you open that bottle right once you once you know that there's something on the other side of that wall it enables us to a greater degree to imagine a world outside of you know what we're seeing what our you know where our friends are you know what they're doing and i think that we i would you know suggest that we do everything we can to to get them out of that four block radius or that yeah. one you know, that one square mile because yep. there's a bigger world outside. Like, so, you know, obviously they often tell, you know, basketball, football, sports, hibbity hop, right? Or, you know, and not that there's anything wrong with like, you know, government jobs, postal jobs, city jobs, and all those are wonderful things. And that's generally what's presented to us. Like that's yep. who you can become. I remember when I was a kid, my, my, my dream was to become a trailways bus driver. Mm. I mean, specifically trailways. I don't even think trailways still exist. No. I mean, Greyhound is the, the bus now, but back then it was trailways. And that was because my dad was a trailways bus driver. And so that's, I said that for, for a long time. Like, that's what I wanted to be. And I, I realized, and, and, you know, I grew up, you know, a similar background, like very difficult, right? Mom, single mom, well-fed, she's the whole nine yards, right? And I remember, and I used to get in fights all the time in school, so I was a fighter. I, you know, I was in there, put my hands up, fight, getting in trouble, you know, 
constantly, right? And one day they they gave a citywide exam. Like so you, every year you get the citywide exam. I, I don't know what I think what well, third grade, fourth grade, whatever. And the way that they scored the test were if you got, you know, if you're in the third grade, you should get a four point something, which basically would say you're on a fourth fourth grade reading level or math level. And so they got my scores back. And I think I was in the fourth grade, and my reading level was like a 12 point something. My math level was a 10 point something. And this is in the fourth grade. And I remember the principal or whoever was in charge calling my mother and saying they wanted to speak to her. Yeah, I thought I was in trouble again. I probably did something the day before. So I was just, you know, I was, I was waiting for that trouble. And they like, you know, and this is, and this is really it. They said, you know, your son's really smart. He could do something with himself, right? Mm -hmm. And that was it. Like it wasn't we gonna put him in some special classes. You were gonna give him the. There, that was it. And so, well, two things. One, way back then, right? They didn't really expect a lot of black boys in that particular school, right? And nothing was really afforded. Like to, you know, the opportunity wasn't put there. But it was like, hey, he's smart. And I remember that was a point of reference for me for so long, like, wait a minute, I got it. And you know, the smart kids in the class, everyone was like, oh, I got a seven point something. You know, what'd you get? 12.2, you lying. I'm like, no, I'm not. It's like that discovery moment where you know what? Maybe I can do something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and just how you, you know, your, your lived experience speaks to that, right? Speaks to that, the realization and the support systems that allowed you to say, wait a minute, I might be able to do this thing. And you are obviously out there crushing it and doing it. So can you tell us about the white coats? Tell yeah. us about the white coats. Yeah, man. So the 15 white coats, uh, you see the photo. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right so there. Right, yeah, right there. There we go. Um, you know, the 15 white coats was very much a surprise, Brad. Um, you know, so June of June, June or July of 2019, um, my best friend, the guy I told you also got Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He came down to visit me um, from New York. He was still getting his PhD. He came down to visit me and we went to the Whitney Plantation. We took my daughter, um, my oldest daughter, and it's like 45 minutes outside of the city. And so when we were coming back, um, we were maybe like 15 minutes down the road uh, after leaving the plantation, and she told me something I'll never forget. She was like, Dad, I finally understand what it means to be a black doctor in America and why it's such a big deal. And basically, I ended up telling her, well, why'd you say that? And she said, well, just think about it. We just left a plantation. And there, we were only able to be like property. We couldn't be accountants or lawyers or doctors or anything. She's like, and now I'm riding in the car with two black doctors. So wow. when an eight-year-old tells you something like that, you kind of got to stop and listen. And so, of course, you know, when I got back, I talked to some of my classmates and told them, you know, I got this idea. You know, I want us to go here and take photos together in all black with our white coats on. And um, that photo will be iconic. Um, literally in the email, it said that this photo will be iconic. So December 14th, 2019, we take this photo, we post it on the internet, social media and everywhere else. And it goes absolutely viral. It like blows up, like way up. Um, and so we decided to take that clout and that, you know, that notoriety and build something that would help the next generation. And so we made a decision that we would raise money and we wouldn't take any of the money that we raised, not one dollar. We don't get paid for any of the work we're doing. It's 100% volunteerism on our part. And the goal is to take the photo and put it into as many classrooms and learning spaces as we can around the world. And, um, and the other thing is to um, raise money to help minorities apply to medical school. So we've been able to successfully do that now. For I guess we're we're going we're heading into our second year now. Um, 
and we've been able to 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 supply some you know some some pretty hefty scholarships uh for for minorities and we have some more that are coming out soon and then we've been able to put that poster in classrooms literally all over the world right now it's on four continents um and it's like all the way in china now wow yeah that's so tough, man. that's just crazy to go behind it that's crazy man. Yeah. wow 15 white coats so so now mm -hmm. you, you you feel that it's a, a responsibility to help open the door for other people that look like you to, yep. to be able to occupy the spaces that you now occupy so yep. how does it feel how do you manage being um the one right one of few right black person in these predominantly white spaces right so you know whether it's grad school whether it's med school what like you often we find ourselves being that one right yeah. how do you manage being the one because unfortunately we don't just get to be you know one of the group right just one of the large masses because more times than not we end up whether we want to or not being a representative of our people yeah, you know you know mo I, I do think that there is this idea that we need to be a representative of um and i think i i, I revel in uh that opportunity at all times because i'm like unadulteratedly black <laughs> like blackity black 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 yeah black. like yeah 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 <laughs> like like what you see right now is what you gonna get in the hospital my hair don't change just because i'm going to the hospital my beard don't change just because i'm going to the hospital my voice don't change just because i'm going to the hospital i don't put glasses on i don't do none of that like this is what you're gonna get and if you don't like this listen at this point I think I didn't get enough to like, I, I don't need to prove myself to you anymore. So I had the luxury of like, just being me. And it just so happens that me is black as hell. So, uh, you know, and, and I mean like culturally I'm black as hell. So, you know, this is what you're going to get. And, and, and it doesn't mean, I think sometimes people equate that to, oh, you know, they're less capable, or older this, older that. Nah, bro, I, I don't think I need to argue with you about my capabilities. I don't really want to go there. Like, you know, that's just where I'm at with it. And so it, I don't really carry a weight around of it, bro. I just, I say what I got to say, man. I say it with my chest. And then <laughs> I got a problem with it. With have a conversation. Like, we can have a conversation if you want. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, I, I like, I don't really have no problems with it, man, because, like, whether it's a hundred black people here or it's one black person here, I'm still just gonna be black. Like I'm gonna be me. And like I'm not being a minority used to bother me. Mm. Um now I'm like, I'm here, bro. Like <laughs> it I'm is here. like I'm gonna do what I can to change it. But at the same time, like I can't sit here and let you bother me. Like I can't sit here and let something that I can't control bother me. So that's fly, man. And, and 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 I really again I really appreciate you. And so even even when I when I reached out to you, and I'm like, I gotta get this brother. You know, from the from the first time we chopped it up, right? Mm -hmm. You we knew right from the door, like, oh, oh this is family. This is family. Yeah. We go get on here and we're gonna talk. Because yeah. you know, there, you know, everyone's black's not the same, right? And and so we're not a monolith, right? You know, we don't want to even put the you know that that narrative out that we're all the same. We're not, but you know. Because and they say things like oh all black all skin folk ain't kin folk is that the phrase something like that yeah right so when when we first started chopping it up I knew at the door like this is my <laughs> man's in there right and, and 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 what's and what's really cool and, and and I just share this what's really cool about like brothers like you is like you don't have to front and 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 for those of you that don't know what front is, it's a ghetto colloquial term that means protect. So if you by slipping and out of like this, the colloquial black ghetto, <laughs> deal with it. All right, y'all already know who I am. So, uh, so no, just being able to connect with you and, and share and feel you, and know that I'm communicating with someone that has overcome the kind of obstacles that most people couldn't even imagine. And I don't mean just regular. I had difficult times. I mean your story. When's the book coming out? That let me get the book because I want a signed copy like at the door. 
Because I mean, it's an, it's an amazing and, and and it's very I mean fortunate that I get to share space and time with brilliant individuals like yourself that are out there really doing it, you know. And for, for myself, like I, I'm unapologetically black. If it's like you said, like it's you're not. I'm not changing the voice. I'm not. Good. It is what it is. I live in many different worlds, right? And I operate as a black man in all of those spaces. Yeah. So I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your family. And I could talk, you know, we could, this could be all night. But, yeah. I, but I know as, as, a, as a husband, as a father, you know, that, that I've got to let you go before you get in trouble. You already had that conversation. <laughs> right? Let's not pretend like, you know. <laughs> so um, where, where can people um, find you? If they want to, I mean, obviously we, you can Google a man, but <laughs> that's not really hard. You can find him on LinkedIn. But where can people find you? You know, IG, Facebook, uh, wherever. Where can they find you? Yeah, at Dr. Russell Leday. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Linktree. Um, you can find me anywhere and everywhere. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, Brother, thank you so very much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate sharing this space with you. Um, and we will connect again because there's so much more to tell. There's so much more to unpack and, and to talk about. But, you know, I just wanted to, again, thank you so very much for your time and for your life course. For, again, you know, for me being able to find another Black man, because it's not rare, right? But to be able to connect with another black man that's out there crushing it in every way. Now, y'all, I told y'all I have the flying skins. Y'all thought it was a game, right? Y'all need to check out my man, Dr. Lede. Thank you so much for your time. Dr. Green speaks. You heard of me. Stop playing games. Yep. Yeah.